Good morning, Resurrection Church. Thanks for tuning in this week after Easter here on Facebook Live or here on YouTube Live, wherever you may be listening. Uh, man, praise God for what he did last week in our fellowship. I thought our 24 hours of prayer from noon on Saturday to noon on Sunday was uh, really powerful. Uh, it was really, really a proud day for me as a pastor to see so many of you uh, vulnerably leading us in prayer. Uh, and so many of you also hopping in to pray wherever you were uh, that day. Uh, it was great seeing your friends and family and different people engaging with those prayers and joining us in that venture. Uh, and I believe we made much of Christ and, and sought Him uh, at this special moment. Uh, then on Easter morning, I thought our uh, virtual service, for lack of a, a better term, went really well. Uh, a lot of folks tuned in. I think some folks heard the gospel clearly. I think believers were encouraged, and I think it was a good morning for our church. So praise God for what he did last week, and praise God for what he's going to continue doing here in our fellowship. Uh, so this week, we're going to continue gathering in our households for household worship. One thing I noticed, though, just as I was leading our own household in, in worship, is that it's really difficult to um, take our liturgy uh, and virtually engage in some part of it and then go back to another part of it later. So what I've decided to do this morning is just have sort of a, a synchronized experience for the whole time of household worship. So uh, with a couple minor exceptions, we're gonna walk through the, the whole liturgy here sort of on Facebook, on YouTube together. So I hope that you are strapped in, buckled up. I've got my Diet Coke, I've got my laptop, I've got my Bible, I've got everything I need. Hope you've got your coffee or whatever, and we'll have a good time of worship. So let's pull out those liturgies. If you have uh, an email from us, it will be there. If not, you can go over to our website right now, resurrectionwv.com, and download the liturgy. So this is week four of household worship. We'll begin with our call to worship. I'll say both the leader and sort of the call and response. Um, so the call from the leader, let us worship our God together. And then together we all say, let us worship in spirit and truth alone, but not forsaken. We worship our God. Now let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, to you, all hearts are open, all desires known. And from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So as we go to our time of confession, I want us to go ahead and read a psalm where the psalmist is asking, God, are you ever going to be favorable again? Will we ever experience your mercy again? And then he remembers the faithfulness and love of God. So uh, let's read Psalm 77. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 77. Uh, and I invite you to, to read this aloud with me in your homes. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. Like the psalmist, we can come to God angry. <laughs> Where have you been? Are you forever going to be angry with us? Are you forever going to withhold your mercy? And this is also an appropriate time for us to remember our finitude, to remember our fallenness, and to remember our brokenness. So each week in our liturgy, we pray a confession of sin. So would you join me with one voice as one people across the valley here in our homes in prayer? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. I remind you this morning of your pardon, God's grace and mercy in your life. I remind you of God's love for you in Christ Jesus. He has died in your place. He has risen from the dead and he is yours forevermore. You are forgiven and loved. Let us sing together this song that we sang last week, Living Hope, as it transitions us well to our sermon. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of kings calls me Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. Change. 
Amen. Thank you, Patricia. It was so good singing with you. Uh, my only regret, of course, that we can't hear one another, but that day will come when it gets here. Um, if, you look at, if you're looking at your liturgy now, it's our Bible discussion sermon time. Um, so the only deviation really from what we've done the last several weeks other than Easter, I'm going to go ahead and preach a brief sermon from 1 Peter and begin sort of a trek through 1 Peter. Um, then I'm going to pray. Then I'm going to lead us in a time of giving. We're going to pass the peace virtually, of course. And then we're going to sing the doxology. Now, I have uh, yet to decide as of right now whether I'm going to sing the doxology on camera or whether I'm going to leave that to your imagination. So uh, I guess we'll see at the end of the service, uh, you know, how, how we're feeling. Um, I will add that I encourage you to please uh, engage your Res Kids curriculum and engage the text that we're using this morning with the SWORD curriculum over lunch. Um, that eating together sort of as a family, as a household, or whoever you're with, um, is sort of uh, a reminder of our dependence on God, that it's an admission that we're finite, that we need something that's not inside of us to, to be inside of us, to sustain us. And so there's a sacredness to the table every time we gather. So as you gather around that table, uh, I pray that you will continue the Bible discussions that we've started here together. On December 15th, I asked a question uh, in one of our Advent sermons. Uh, how do we live well uh, in God's story when we're going through difficult seasons in our life? Um, I argued from a text in 1 Peter uh, that we live with a sure and steady hope, and that gives rise to sure and steady joy, even in various trials. Of course, on December 15th, we had no idea that a global pandemic and doing church services sort of in our homes and trying to synthesize those or synchronize those rather um, virtually uh, would be in the cards for our whole fellowship in churches around the globe. Um, as I thought about where to go in these weeks, my mind went back to that sermon and my mind went back to that question. How do we live well uh, as believers in difficult or in trying seasons of life? And that led me to reading more of 1 Peter and reminded me of why so many commentators note how helpful um, 1 Peter is for Christians who are suffering or uh, Christians who are persecuted or Christians who face um, trials of various kinds. Uh, Peter's epistle is both doctrinal and practical. It's both beautiful and helpful. It shows us a great and glorious God and helps us understand our place in his story while uh, also helping us figure out how to live in the everyday stuff of life. In this epistle, Peter speaks to suffering and uh, perhaps persecuted Christians, and he ties their hope for their uncertain present to a fixed past and a fixed future. Through the resurrection of Christ in the past, we live today with a faith that will result in the future in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. So our uncertain present is uh, understood in the context of a certain past and a very certain future. We will reach many beautiful heights in 1 Peter. We will learn many beautiful truths in 1 Peter. We'll learn that as God's people, we are living stones rejected by men, but chosen by God. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. But that truth is in this hand, and then in this hand we hold the truth that we are despised and rejected by man. We hold the truth that we are sojourners and exiles and aliens walking through a land that is not home. God calls us in First Peter to live well before outsiders, to be good stewards of the glory and grace of God, that we would let God's glory shine through our lives, that we would be loving and hospitable and humble and a servant to all. This morning, in our homes, separate yet 
unified in spirit, we fix our eyes on Jesus and begin learning how to live as God's chosen people and as sojourners and exiles. We begin thinking about how can we live well in uncertain times in this world of pain and sickness, in this world that is not ours. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 1. Um, we're going to look at the introduction to this epistle in verses 1 and 2. Then we're going to spend a few minutes looking at verses 3 and 5, considering our merciful God and our living hope. And then in verses 6 through 9, we'll consider why we can rejoice in trials. So look with me in chapter 1, verse 1 of First Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. A couple of things I want us to see here um, in this introduction. Uh, Peter identifies himself as the author of the letter. He identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He is a representative of Jesus. He is a sent one of Jesus. He's an emissary of Jesus. He was, of course, one who followed him during his earthly ministry. He writes to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, living in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Um, interesting language here that I think communicates two truths. Uh, really, the first truth is that we are chosen by God, and the second truth is that wherever they live, that place is not a home. So the text says, to those who are elect exiles, uh, the New American Standard Bible translates this, aliens who are chosen, right? The idea we have is this reality that we are elect, we are chosen by God, and we are exiles. We are living in a land that is not ours. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Um, this language of dispersion, of the diaspora, uh, is typically used in the Old Testament to speak of Jews who don't live in their, uh, their native homeland. They are said to be diaspora Jews. And so here, Peter envisions Christians who live in all of these places as diaspora peoples, people who are um, living in a land that is not theirs, living in a land that is not home. So it's in this introduction that Peter is introducing these themes of being chosen by God, um, but also these themes of being um, sort of marginalized by the world, by living in a land that, that is not hours. Now, verse 2, he introduces sort of some more content about what it means that we are Christians, that we are chosen by God. And he focuses in this part of the introduction in our sort of relationship to God. Let's pick it up in verse 2, and, and you'll see what we're talking about. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Um, here, Peter's introduction takes a Trinitarian formulation. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. You are chosen by God, according to the will of the Father. You are saved. You enter God's family when you're sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, when, when the blood of Jesus is sort of over your life, and you are formed into a son or daughter of God, you are formed into who you already are, who Christ has made you, in the sanctification of the Spirit. Here, the life of God is sort of seen as the driving force of the life of a Christian. In this introduction, we're learning that the life of the Christian is wrapped up in the life of God. To think rightly of ourselves, we must think rightly of God. The life of God gives rise to and is the life of the Christian. God's people who are not home, but whose lives are wrapped up in God. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Let us consider in verses 3 through 5. 
our merciful God, and the living hope to which he's called us. Verse 3. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 3 begins with an exclamation, a shout of praise, an acclamation of praise, right? Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. So we praise God from the very beginning of this letter. The first thing that Peter has to say to suffering Christians is not, oh, everything is so hard. The first thing he has to say to Christians who are struggling is, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We praise God because in his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to two things. We are born again to a living hope. We are born again to an inheritance that is perfect and awaiting us in heaven. Now, when we speak of that inheritance, it's enough in these moments to just speak broadly that the life of a Christian will result in a reward from God that is, is perfect and that he is keeping that reward for us. And at the very least, that reward is him and all that he is. is It's stored up in heaven for us to receive when we get there, right? Our inheritance, the life that awaits us, broadly speaking, is imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading, it is safe, it is secure. A moth and rust can't sneak in and destroy, uh, a thief can't take it, and a virus cannot touch it. So it's good news for us that we've been born again to a living hope, and we've been born again to an inheritance that is unfading. So that is sort of our hope, that in our first birth, uh, we're born to die. In our second birth, when we're born again in Christ, we're born to live. And that life that we live in Christ will result in an inheritance that God is keeping for us. These truths are beautiful. But I, I don't know if it's just because I'm, I'm fickle, but verse 5 speaks to me in even uh, warmer tones. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So the text is then teaching that God is keeping our inheritance for us, that we have a living hope, that our hope is tied up in him, and that all of those realities outside of us are fixed and they, they ain't going anywhere. But Peter's also teaching here that God is guarding us. So God is keeping the inheritance and God is guarding us as we journey to get that inheritance. By God's power, through faith, we are being guarded for salvation. That, that God is going to get us to the finish line. Like the hope of the Christian is that God is in control of our lives. That, that nothing can snatch us out of the palm of his hands. And that we might struggle, we might limp, we might suffer. But God is going to drag us across the finish line. Uh, when I preached this text uh, back in Advent in um, sort of that context, uh, I shared a story of our last trip to South Asia. Uh, Kevin and I went to Bhutan, uh, a great little country near, uh, near India, and we did the, the trek to Tiger's Nest, which is a famous monastery up on the side of a mountain that like takes all day, and uh, I did it no sweat. I mean, Kevin was lagging behind and really struggling to go up the mountain. Um, just kidding, uh, Kevin was fine, I was struggling a little bit, but you know what, we made it, and it wasn't too bad, you know, it was awesome. Um, our guide told us it was an average time. I don't know if he was just saying that to be kind or if that was actually true. But our guide also told us a story of an 80-year-old woman who made the same trek that we made. Um, and 
that trek took her much, much, much longer than it took us. It took her about um, 10 hours. But he told the story of, of her climbing the mountain and how there were parts where she would literally hop on his back and he would carry her. And then they reach the top of the mountain and they see the monastery and she's you know, looking at this famous, famous site and she has uh, done this thing that, that you know, most people her age could never think of doing. And, and she just welled up with tears and just, it just cried and wept in joy that, that she had seen this. And I thought sort of how this is a beautiful metaphor for the text, right? That a metaphor for the Christian life, rather, that um, God is getting us somewhere uh, not because of our own strength and, and power, but because of his strength and power. And this, this scripture is teaching us that, that we are being guarded by God. So anything that's going to touch us is going to have to get through God first. That anything that gets in our lives only gets there because God has allowed it there. And he is guarding us through faith for the inheritance that we will one day receive. We have a merciful God. We are born again to a living hope. Verse six, in this, in this reality, in this reality that we have a merciful God, in this reality that we've been born again to a living hope, in this reality that our, our inheritance is pure and undefiled and God's protecting it, in this reality that we are going to receive it, not just because God's protecting it, but because God's guarding us in this reality. We rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In this we rejoice, though now, if you're taking notes, jot these phrases down. For a little while, first. If necessary, second. And various, third. Peter teaches these three things about our trials. First, for a little while, we learn that those trials are temporary. That none of this pain that we experience lasts in the same acute sense forever. And even the ones that do linger and linger and linger in the scope of eternity, they are temporary. Though now for a little while. Secondly, if necessary, if necessary, meaning here, Peter's teaching that in some sense, the trials that we experience are necessary. Now, let me say a word of caution. It is extraordinarily dangerous and almost always inappropriate to speculate about exactly why certain trials are necessary. For instance, if um, a friend or family members of yours is hurting and they come to you and they share the hurt and the first thing that you do is tell them why that suffering is necessary, you're probably more like one of Job's friends. And if you don't know that reference, go check it out. Just Google Job's friends. They're full of platitudes, but kind of missing the point. So we know our trials are for a little while. They're temporary. And in some sense, they're necessary. It's dangerous to assign motives and figure out exactly why different trials were necessary and what exactly God was trying to do in there. But we'll suffice to say for our sermon this morning, the trials have reasons for which we are largely unaware. There's a quote that has always been helpful in my life. I think it's from John Piper. Um, he says, God is always doing 10,000 things in our life of which we might be aware of three. <laughs> right? That there are all these things happening that we have no idea of that would impact us in ways we, ha we could never see. And that this God understands how all these things fit together. So our trials are temporary. And in some sense, in God's plan, they are necessary. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. When we preached from this text and we talked about various trials last time, we talked about um, probably criticism and cancer and relational problems and uh, all things in between 
this morning, our focus specifically is on living faithfully during a pandemic. It's sacrificing. It's um, how do we do church? How do we live as a Christian? How do we go about our lives? How do we do all these things? That's the trial that we face today. So we face trials for a little while that are necessary, that are varied. We face all sorts of trials. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The redemptive element of a trial is that the trials in our lives are efficacious. And what I mean by that is the trials in our lives that we don't like, those trials are doing something, right? Faith, a, a genuine, beautiful faith, I would argue is forged in the crucible of trials. So not only are our trials temporary, they're only for a little while, not only are they necessary in some way, not only are they sort of various, they come in all forms, but they're doing something. They're creating something in us that would not have been created without the suffering that comes with that trial. Charles Spurgeon has a wonderful quote on this passage. We must expect trial because trial is the element of faith. Here we go. Faith without trial is like a diamond uncut. That's a good one to write down. It's not from me. It's good though. Faith without trial is like a diamond uncut. The brilliance of which has never been seen. A fish without water or a bird without air is faith without trial. When trials come, it reveals what faith we have and it forces us to either turn to God or away from God. We're either developing that faith or we're running from that faith. Faith without trial is like an uncut diamond. How do I know if I have faith if I'm never in a situation where I need to use faith? I don't know if I'm courageous or bold until I need to be courageous or bold. What if the trials in our lives are gracious gifts of God because those trials are creating something in us that is far better than a life without those trials. Faith without trial is like an uncut diamond. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, verse 7, which is more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That these various, these temporary and these necessary trials are creating something in you that will result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, as we wind to a close. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your soul, of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter says you don't see God today, but even though you don't see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Um, this morning, like the Christians in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, uh, we do not see God, but we rejoice in him with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory because we are obtaining, even in the midst of difficult and trying days, the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls, that nothing can change that reality, that we live in uncertain days tied to the reality of certain truths anchored in the past and anchored in the future. 
just like we don't see God today, we don't see each other today, but we love each other and we rejoice that together we are growing in Christ. We rejoice that together we are um, developing and fostering a faith that is better than a life that we can just do whatever we want, whenever we want, and, and have things back to normal. This morning, uh, we live as locked down exiles. Now, when the lockdown lifts, which may not be long, I'm not sure, still will we be exiles. So join us over the next several weeks as we explore life in exile. I think life in lockdown is a good time to consider life in exile. I'm praying that over these several weeks, God will teach us how to live well wherever we find ourselves, that we will remember who we truly are in Christ, that we will learn how to live well before outsiders, and that we will face this trial with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Come, sojourners and exiles, let's journey together. Amen. Thank you for your attention during that uh, sermon. I would say brief, but I think it was like 20, 25 minutes. So uh, thank you for atten your attention during that. I'm trying to think of ways to uh, continue to provide theological content, to uh, explain, make clear, give sense to the Word of God as we journey through this pandemic together, but not together. So as you look at your prayer guides or your worship guides, the next stop on our liturgical journey is prayer. So I'm going to say a brief prayer for us here uh, in headquarters, and I invite you to say a, a prayer with me in your home. So let's pray. Um, God, thank you for your word uh, that speaks to us in every season of our life. Help us walk through this trial well. Uh, help us, Lord, develop a faith that is of more value than gold that will result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, God, our hearts this morning are with um, those who are, are fighting this pandemic on the front line still. We pray for um, doctors, nurses, hospital personnel. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are uh, family and friends of those who are ill. We pray for uh, those who are uh, impacted by this uh, on so many levels. Uh, we pray for our leaders as they navigate the days ahead that they will do so with uh, wisdom and kindness for the common good. Uh, I pray for our church this morning that we will be um, built up in your word, Lord. There's so many um, things that, that we can bring before you in prayer this morning. So hear these prayers of your saints in the homes of uh, resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the next uh, stop on our uh, liturgical journey is to give. So I invite you to go to resurrectionwv.com and go to the give page. I've got my trusty laptop here. Uh, it's a little awkward giving in front of folks, so I'm just going to do a small amount. We have, Holly and I have a sort of a recurring thing going. So you can go and give. I got all signed in here. Uh, we'll just we'll go we'll go you know twenty bucks. We can we can do that. Um, general fund one time. There we go. So I invite you to give. I invite you to give to the church there. I invite you also to pull out your phones. Go to Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, whatever you got, uh, Apple Pay, and send some cash to. Um, somebody who's struggling, maybe a service personnel, uh, a, a barista, a, a, a waiter, I couldn't think of the word waiter, um, somebody who's impacted by this, send them a few bucks and let them know you care. So uh, I will send that in a bit, track that person down. So I encourage you to do that um, right now. Um, now it's time to pass the piece. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna FaceTime uh, unsuspecting person. Uh, let's do Molly. One, because I'm comfortable bothering her. Uh, two, because it's her birthday. So uh, we're going to pass the piece to Molly. So I encourage you to FaceTime, call, or text someone here. This is going to be good. <laughs> hey, Molly. <laughs> and the Lord's peace be with you. And with you. And with you. I hope you're doing well. Thank um, you. 
You're welcome. I like I like to FaceTime Molly like yeah, I'm not gonna be rude like this. And um, it's also Molly's birthday, so uh, happy birthday, Molly. Everyone say happy birthday, Molly. Happy Thank birthday, you. Molly. Happy birthday to you. you. You live in a Baby. zoo. So we passed the piece. <laughs> That's great. I hope you do that with somebody. She's like, what are you doing? Now, let's sing the doxology. Oh, man, I want to do this. Let's do it. Praise God from whom all blessings. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. Let's just end it with that. Yeah. I can't do it. <laughs>